that separated me from Christ my Lord. It was so vast the crossing I could never afford. From where I was to his domain, it seemed so far. I cried, dear Lord, I cannot come to where you are. He came to me. He came to me when I could not come to where he was. He came to me. That's why he died on Calvary when I could not come to where he was he came to me he came to me when I was bound chains of my sin. He came to me when I possessed no hope within. He picked me up and gently drew me to his side. Where That's why he died on Calvary when I could not come to where he was. He came to me when I could not come to where he was. He came to me. Amen. Let's take our Bibles this morning, turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 8. And if you're a guest with us, we are on a journey. We call it Journey with Jesus, and we're going step by step through the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Luke gives the most chronological, ordered process in studying the life of Jesus Christ, and uh, it gives more of the events in the life of Christ and uh, more of the uh, miracles and so many of the attributes of Christ and we're just enjoying this study uh, we've been in it now for almost a year we're going to be in it another year or so I'm sure uh, just step by step journeying with Jesus let's all stand together for our scripture reading time this morning if you're a guest and have not already noticed there's an outline in your bulletin and uh, I'd encourage you to uh, use that outline this morning it'll help you kind of keep pace with us we'll give it a lot of different support text and so forth that might help you in understanding this passage. And so let me encourage you to use that if you'd like to. Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Follow with me this morning as I read Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 21. And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others which ministered unto him of their substance. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it, and some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, 
and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to others in parables that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time temptation of temptation fall away. And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. No man, when he hath lighted a candle, covereth it with a vessel, or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in may see the light. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Take heed, therefore, how you hear. For whosoever he hath, to him shall be given, and whosoever hath not, from him shall take, be taken even that which he seemeth to have. Then came to him his mother and his brethren, and could not come at him for the press. And it was told him by certain which said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to see thee. And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. So in three different sections this morning, we see the parable of the sower, we hear about the light that should not be hid under the bed, and also in reference to Jesus' own mother, Jesus mentions in all three of these settings the word of God and how we should hear the word of God. And so let's learn from the word of our Lord this morning and let's pray right now and ask God to teach us from his word. Father in heaven, we thank you for the infallible, incorruptible word today. We thank you that it is the seed that is sown into the hearts of all who are saved. We pray that if there are those here today that have never with good ground of faith received the word and been saved, that today would be that day when they would receive Christ. And we pray that every one of us this morning would be challenged to live the word and to sow the word and, Father, to be effective witnesses and soul winners for you. And I pray this now in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning we learn that Jesus Christ wants his disciples with their whole hearts to place faith in his incorruptible word. One author said concerning faith, Everybody lives by faith in something or someone. The difference between the Christian believer and the unsaved person is not that one has faith and the other does not. They both have faith. The difference is the object of their faith. The difference in the object and the fact is that our faith is only as good as the object. The Christian believer has put his faith in Jesus Christ and he bases that faith on the Word of God. How many of you today have put your faith in Jesus Christ? Amen? Amen? And if you've done that, it was based upon the Word of God and that which was shared with you from the Word of God. Now the major theme of Luke chapter 8 is the variety of responses to the Word of God. The fact is that Jesus had been sowing the seed throughout Galilee, but he had experienced many different responses. And if you are a seed sower, you're going to experience many different responses as well. You're going to find there's a lot of different kinds of soil out there in the world in which we live. As we open up the text to verse number one, we first hear about the message of Jesus. And by way of introduction, I want you to notice it says, It came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. After Jesus had performed a wonderful miracle for the widow's son, the Bible says that his ministry is continuing throughout the Galilean region and that he is spreading the good news of the kingdom and preaching concerning salvation. 
The fact is that in Matthew 9 and verse 35, it says Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus went to the early cities of that Galilean region, cities like this one shown here uh, in Capernaum. Uh, they were very humble cities, but cities sometimes of 100, sometimes 300, sometimes less. Jesus went to the cities, the villages, and the Bible tells us he would often go right into the synagogues. And we learned that uh, from the synagogue of Nazareth, he was expelled out uh, by the elders of the synagogue who wanted nothing to hear, nothing of what Jesus had to say. We know that at the synagogue here at Capernaum, God performed great miracles and there were many who began to believe in that Galilean region. And traveling with Jesus were those that had been saved and uh, his new converts, if you will, these disciples who just wanted to hear more and wanted to support the Lord Jesus. And the Bible tells us about them in verse 2. It says, and certain women were traveling with Jesus and with the twelve as well. And these were women that had uh, been healed of evil spirits and infirmity, infirmities. And, and, and I want you to just take note of that by way of introduction. Jesus did not travel in isolation, but there were always others that traveled with him. And uh, he had support from them. In fact, the Bible says in verse 3, they ministered unto him of their substance, these people. They ministered unto Jesus of their substance. And the word substance means their possessions, their goods, their wealth. Uh, they took from what they had. And I can envision them cooking meals and I can envision them uh, perhaps creating a lean-to where Jesus might sit and rest or any one of a number of things, a variety of things. In fact, the Jewish rabbis of the first century often were supported by those whom they taught and the people that they had been teaching would, would stand by that teacher and support him. And that's similar to the New Testament church as the church began to take hold. Uh, they in turn would support the apostles from their substance so that the apostles could go from city to city preaching and starting new churches and proclaiming the word of God. And we read about that in Philippians 4 and I want you to see that very briefly because sometimes people think that giving of our substance is like the trick of the church and all they want is our money. But you'll find that in a real way when people were saved they wanted to help Jesus' ministry to continue. They wanted to support that ministry. Look what Paul said in Philippians 4.15. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving but ye only for even in Thessalonica you sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. And so we see going back uh, to the Old Testament teachers and rabbis, they supported uh, the teacher, that one that was listening in the synagogue. Those ones would support the work of the synagogue. And then in the life and ministry of Jesus, those that had been healed, those that had been saved from their substance, they, they supported the work of the Lord Jesus. And by the way, wouldn't that have been a privilege? And, and yet, in reality, we are still supporting the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ today when we give in and by and through the local New Testament church because this church is the bride of Christ, this is the work of Christ, and we're just saying, let's keep the message of Christ going forward. And that's what they did with the Apostle Paul. He said, boy church at Philippi, nobody gave like you gave. You were such a help and such a blessing. And look at the people that were giving. The Bible tells us about them. One in verse 2 was Mary Magdalene. And if you've ever studied Mary Magdalene, she was probably from the little city of Magdala and uh, hence called Mary Magdalene. But she was a woman that got caught up in the occult and demonism. And she had seven demons that lived inside of her. And they terrorized her physically and emotionally. And yet when she met Jesus, nobody can have Jesus in their life and have demons in their life at the same time. And she received Jesus as her Savior, and those demons fled. And I tell you what, from a heart of gratitude, she walked with Jesus. She served the Lord Jesus. She gave of her substance to Him. And then the Bible tells us there was another a lady that followed in this particular passage. Her name was Joanna. She was the wife of the administrator to Herod. I think it's interesting to just take a quick moment and understand that people from all classes of life were listening to Jesus and were believing on Jesus. And how many of you are thankful that the gospel is not just for the cultural elite, it's not just for the wealthy. The gospel was for everyone uh, from Herod's administration to a lowly woman who was demon-possessed. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, or what you've done, there's power in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And they were all following after the Lord Jesus. Then there's a third woman named Susanna, mentioned only here in the New Testament. Uh, and we know nothing else about her except that she was a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of these people are about to hear Jesus speak about the importance of the Word of God. Our relationship to the Word of God. And Jesus is going to give us three commandments today with respect to His Word. And the first one is, He wants us to receive His Word. He wants us to receive His Word. And He says in verse number 4, that as He gathered these people together, He spake by a parable. A parable is a narrative. It's, it's fictitious but agreeable to the laws uh, of God. And, and it's agreeable to the usages of human life. And it speaks about the work of God, and it speaks about the kingdom of God. And there's normally a moral to the parables. There's some spiritual lesson that is intended for spiritual people to discern. Jesus was real clear that those who did not believe in him would not understand these parables. I remember uh, hearing the story of a, of a little boy named Tommy who was in the first grade Sunday school class, and he loved his first grade class, and he loved his teacher. And boy, his teacher, Mrs. Smith, she always gave great lessons. And at the end of every lesson, she would always say, now, boys and girls, the moral of the story is, and then she'd give the moral of the story every week, week after week after week. She'd tell a story. At the end of the story, she'd say, now, boys and girls, the moral of the story is, and she'd give them the moral of the story. Well, the day came when Tommy was uh, transferred over to the second grade class. And so he went to the second grade class, and, and they had a nice teacher, Mrs., uh, Mrs. Jones. And Mrs. Jones would tell the story, and, and uh, she would always uh, uh, give an exciting story. But at the end of her story, uh, she would never say, and the moral of the story is. It was just, just a different style, different presentation. And a few weeks into this, Tommy's mother said, now, Tommy, how are you enjoying your new Sunday school class? And and Tommy said, well, Mrs. Jones is okay. The problem is she doesn't have any morals. <laughs> now, i got to tell you something, that in the parables, there was always a moral. Jesus always had something he was trying to get across. And so in this parable, he's going to give us, first of all, the description of the soils. And what you want to remember here is that the soil is representative of different types of hearts. The soil speaks about the different hearts that Jesus was encountering there in Galilee. And as the harvest time perhaps was underway there in Palestine in the late fall, uh, they would have had in their mind a picture of harvest. And they understood uh, the difference between the area of the thistles and the good ground. And Jesus is kind of using uh, the farming metaphor to help them understand the spiritual work. The Bible says in Matthew 13, 19, that which is sown in his heart. And so Jesus is very clear that his target is the heart. Somebody might walk out of here this morning and say, that preacher stepped on my toes. If I did, I missed my target because my target is your heart this morning. And that's God's target this morning. He wants his word into your heart. And so notice as we look at the description of the soils, we come to this verse number five. A sower went out to sow his seed and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside and it was trodden down and the fowls of the air devou devoured it. The first type of soil that we see is the hard ground. It's that ground that is, in, that is uh, shown as the pathway through the field or the road on the side of the field. And this uh, particular person that is a hearer uh, is hearing with his ears but not with his heart. Sometimes he's a scoffer. Sometimes uh, he's a scorner. Uh, his heart is like this picture of the dry lake bed out at Edwards Air Force Base, about 35 miles or so from here, is a dry lake bed. Ladies and gentlemen, it is so hard that without asphalt, without preparation, without tractors and engineers preparing the way, they can land 747 jets on this piece of property because it's so hard. And I'm telling you, I have witnessed to some people that I'm confident you could land a 747 on their heart too. In fact, you could take a D8 caterpillar tractor, run it all over their heart. They'd never feel it because spiritually they are what Jesus calls a hard-hearted person. And the fact is this morning that while they reject the Bible and they have all kinds of excuses, in reality men do not reject the Bible because the Bible contradicts itself. Men reject the Bible because it contradicts them. And they don't want to be told that they're wrong or that they have sin in their life. And that's why Hosea said in Hosea 10 and verse 12, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. And so Jesus said, some of your hearts are like solid 
hard ground. And then secondly, he speaks about a type of heart that is referred to as the rocky ground. And in verse 6, he says, some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. I've seen ground like this on different farms, and sometimes over, a, a, over an area of rockiness, there'll even be a slight layer of soil, and, and uh, some seed may fall there, and there may be the semblance of some life, but because there's really not the quality of soil, the roots never get down, and in reality, nothing ever really happens. And Jesus says, you know, sometimes with some of the hearers, it seems like there's a little interest. There's maybe a sprig of life. Uh, maybe there's uh, some sight that maybe there was some interest, but then it withers right away because they never were truly rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ. And then there's the third type of soil that is mentioned, and that is this, this thorny ground, verse 7. And as some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. Now thorns take up the nourishment of the soil, and, and uh, they oftentimes are very destructive of the crops. And they'll take an area that at one time was very fruitful and completely decimated, and we'll see in a moment that there are many types of thorns that will steal away the effectiveness of the seed. And again, that's why Jeremiah said, break up your fallow ground and sow not among the thorns, you see. And so uh, here we see the different types of soil coming to the fourth type here in verse 8. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. So Jesus said, now, I've had a lot of different receptions. I've had hard-hearted people and stony-hearted people and thorns in the hearts of people, but he said, I want to tell you, there's been some good ground. There's been Mary Magdalene. There's been Joanna. There's been Susanna. There's been these 12. He said, there have been some that have received the soil into a heart of faith. And these are those that their yield has been very evident. There's been fruit in their life. Now, I think we need to be careful of trying in our own human understanding to say how much fruit needs to be in the life of a of a believer. I think we become judges in that sense that it, it's not our place. I'm not uh, a fruit inspector primarily. I'm primarily a seed sower in the sense of getting the gospel out. But I do believe that Jesus is telling us that when there's someone that's saved, truly saved, and that with a heart of faith and good ground, the soil comes in and, and the seed comes into that soil, one of the things you're going to see from the life of a convert of Jesus Christ is a change in their life. There's going to be fruit that comes forth from their life. And Jesus speaks of this as the good ground. The others may fail, but the good ground, uh, the good heart, the heart of faith, the heart of sincerity and honesty that receives the gospel will bring forth fruit. Is that what we read about in Psalm chapter 1, Psalm 1, verse 2? But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate both day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, that's why we're here this morning, to get our roots around the Word of God so that we might grow and prosper as those who are followers of Christ. And so we see the description of these soils. But notice, secondly, the declaration of the Savior. Jesus says there's a lot of different kinds of hearts out there. But then he says, I want you to understand something about this parable. Notice in verse 8, at the latter portion of the verse, he says, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. The first thing that Jesus says is, now listen up to this parable. Don't sit here as someone with thorny filled hearts telling me that you're okay. Jesus is saying, make sure that you're hearing what I'm trying to tell you. Make sure that this message is getting in. You know, those of us who are involved in soul winning and witnessing, we need to do our best to give a clear gospel presentation to make sure that someone knows what the Bible says about sin and separation from God and that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that He is the only way and that His blood atones for our sin and that by faith men can be saved. I'm not saying that someone has to be a theologian in order to be saved, but someone needs to understand the gospel in order to be saved. And Jesus is saying, if you've got ears, make sure you're listening to what I'm telling you. Make sure that you have a heart that's good and right and ready to hear what I'm saying. And he says, secondly, understand this parable. You see, parables reveal the mysteries of the kingdom. And here's his giving an understanding of the parable to us. Notice what he tells us beginning in verse number 11. He says, 
Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Would you say that with me? The seed is the word of God. All right, one more time. The seed is the The seed is the word of God. Thank God this morning, 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Sometimes I think church members wonder, why do pastors get so nervous about all the new Bible versions or paraphrases? And we hear about the the different ones, Reader's Digest, and we hear about all the different uh, types of modern day types of versions. The reason that we get so concerned about that is because like a good farmer knows the difference between the good seed and the seed that's just been laying around and the seed that's been contaminated and the seed that's not so effective. Like a farmer is very, very selective about what kind of seed he's going to plant out in the field. A consistent and a concerned pastor and church member is also very concerned about the seed that is being sown. And that's why for 28 years I have preached from the King James Version of the Bible because I believe that the incorruptible seed that has been proven and used by God over the centuries to reach so many souls in the English-speaking world. Around the world, God has used this incorruptible seed to bring life into the good hearts of men and women who honestly believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, the seed is not the Sunday school curriculum, and the seed is not the book that somebody wrote, and the seed is not in some Johnny-come-lately religion. The seed is the Word of God, and it's an incorruptible Word and we should love it, and we should sow it, and recognize that the seed is what brings life to someone that is truly born again. We are born again by the incorruptible seed. Now, the seed is the Word of God. Secondly, the seed by the wayside, just looking at what Jesus is saying here, the seed that's by the wayside is that seed that is plucked up, notice this, verse 12, by the devil himself. Because it says there in verse number 12, lest they should believe and be saved. Now look right here. Have you ever tried to talk to somebody about Jesus and all of a sudden somebody barges into the house or all of a sudden the stereo goes off or I have been preaching sermons when the alarm system goes off in the church? Has it ever dawned on you when all of that is taking place that there's a real devil that doesn't want the incorruptible seed into the hearts of men? I mean, there's a, every time I stand to preach, there's a spiritual battle going on. And the Bible says that, that there's a man or a woman that has this hardened heart. That's exactly how the devil wants their heart because as soon as the seed bounces off that heart, he's going to pick it up and try to take it away. His goal is to prevent uh, belief uh, in order that people would not believe and be saved. And then we see the next uh, style uh, of, of heart or the next type of heart described as the seed on the rock. Those are those who have no root. There's not been a true rooting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not to say that they were saved and then lost. The Bible tells us uh, that there are those here uh, in verse 13 that were on the rock, which they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root. In other words, uh, they make an emotional per profession perhaps, they're excited for a moment, they came to a music concert or a revival once, and, 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 and there seemed to be something there but the, the distinguishing factor in these lives is often this. Here's the test. Will that person stand when trials come? It's called a test of faith. Will that person stand? You say, well, where do you get that from, Pastor Chapel? Notice it says, uh, and they have no root, verse 13, which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. Uh, they had a belief but it was not the belief of the good ground. It was not the type that was truly a conversion in the sense of a heart that was changed. Uh, and the evidence of that is the first time a little trial comes, they fall away. It doesn't mean they were saved and then lost it. It means that their profession was not a true profession. Psalm 106 and verse 12 then believed they his words, they sang his praise, they soon forgot his works, they waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tend to God in the desert. There are people like that. There are people that when the good times are going and when their family's doing all right, oh, Jesus just made everything so, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus, oh yeah. And they make a profession, and then when their family's not doing so well and they've lost their job, the first person they blame is Jesus Christ because they never truly believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I think about sometimes 
our churches in America. I had one evangelist one time say to me, I wonder if 50% of the members of America's churches are saved. And I thought, boy, that's kind of a tough statement to make. I would hope that there's a lot more than that saved at Lancaster Baptist Church. But I will tell you this, I do wonder if real persecution came to the church in America, how many people would unashamedly stand for Jesus Christ no matter what the cost. Think about this man over in Iran, Pastor Saeed Abedina. This man was imprisoned for preaching the gospel and was sentenced recently, just this past week, for many more years in prison for the simple crime of being a Christian. How many people do you know who have a bumper sticker, who do a little you know, Christian rock jingle and talk about their love for Jesus? How many people do you know like that who would go to jail because they're a Christian? That's what Jesus is saying. A lot of these folks that make a shallow profession, the first flame of persecution, they're going to say, hey, I didn't really mean it. And that is what Jesus describes here as this seed that had no root. And then thirdly, he said there's the seed that's amongst the thorns. Look at that in verse 14. And that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring forth no fruit to perfection or to completion. These are people that you witness to them and, and there's, there's maybe some interest and they take your gospel track but then suddenly uh, their friends say, hey, you don't need to go to church next Sunday. I, you can make $100 more if you'll come with me. And we got this side job. And hey, there's a big party and we're going to all watch a football game. They break out the beer and the party. And pretty soon the cares of this world begin to choke out the seed that was left. And, and the cares of this world begin to choke out the work that God had desired to do. And when I think about uh, these types of weeds, I think about the Canadian thistle weed. Back when I was a young man working on the farms in the summer in Colorado, back with my grandpa there, there. Uh, whenever my granddad or my uncle saw this Canadian thistle, they always said the same thing to me. They said, Paul, go get a hoe and get that Canadian thistle out of the field. And they always said this, and get it by the root, boy. They said, you don't just chop a weed off. How many of you understand that? You don't chop a weed off. You've got to get the root up, right? You've got to dig all throughout that root and get the root up because this particular plant right here, the roots can go as deep as 15 to 20 feet and they can go as far as 15 to 20 feet. And the fact of the matter is just a little bit of these seed falling here and there can take out dozens and hundreds of acres from a good field. And so Jesus said, some of the people I've talked to, uh, I've sensed that they've had a lot of weed uh, choking out the seed that I've tried to give to them. And, and that's why we need to remember what Jesus said in 1 Timothy 6, 17 charge them or what Paul said charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high minded nor trust in uncertain riches but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy I got to tell you something friend you can work overtime every Sunday you can make millions upon millions of dollars but you will never buy your way into heaven you see a man may go to heaven without his friends or without his wealth or without his health but you'll never go to heaven without Jesus Christ and so Jesus said, there's just been some that just seems like the cares of this world choked out the seed. But then finally, he tells us about this good ground in verse 15. And he says, but on that good ground are they which, notice this now, in an honest and good heart. See, only, how many believe that only God knows the heart? How many know there's some people that might say a prayer for mama? How many of you understand that's a dishonest heart? Someone might say a prayer for who knows what, but here he says, but there have been those with an honest heart, with a good heart, notice this, they heard the word, they kept it, and they're bringing forth fruit with patience. Isn't that a wonderful description of the Christian life? Amen. Jesus says, with this good heart, they heard it, and they kept it, and now they're just bearing fruit with patience. And that's why I love being the pastor of Lancaster Baptist Church, because I get to pastor a lot of people who were not super Christians and overnight just doing the biggest and the greatest, but just patiently, consistently bearing fruit. That, my friends, is what God has called us to do. It is required of a steward that a man be found faithful. And you might not look as successful as another Christian might look, but as long as you're bearing your fruit with patience, I believe you're on the right track 
for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it is that these good-hearted people consistently kept the Word of God and consistently served and loved the Lord and kept His commandments. And so Jesus says, I want you to remember, first of all, to receive the Word with a good heart. And if you're here this morning and you have never with a good, honest heart, a heart that is truly turning to Christ with faith and have not received Christ as your Savior, how I would urge you to do that today. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear the Word. Then Jesus says, secondly, I want you to keep the Word. I want you to keep my word. And in verse 16, he, he uses another metaphor. He says, No man, when he hath lighted a candle, covereth it with a vessel, or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in may see the light. He says, I want you to take my light, and I want you to keep it in your life. I want my word to be prevalent in your life, so that people will see the difference that I've made, so that they will see my light in you. My good friend, Dr. Bobby Robertson, who I spoke to this week, he said one time to me, he said, look, he said, we don't have to keep the light shining, but we need to keep the bulb clean. I like that. You see, Jesus is the light. And if you're saved, he's in your life. But the bulb, that speaks of sanctification. That speaks of clean living. I don't want anything that I'm doing to hinder the light from going out to a lost and dying world. And that's why Christians ought to live a different lifestyle than this world. And so we see that we're to keep the Word. Now notice the Word of God illuminates. It illuminates. And the image is very clear. God says, I don't want you to take my Word and hide it under a bed. He says, I want you to let my Word shine. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify my Father which is in heaven. Moody said, a holy life will make the deepest impression. Lighthouses blow no horns. They just shine. And ladies and gentlemen, this week I want to challenge you. Shine for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let His Word shine through your life and through your lips. Be a faithful witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 2.16 Holding forth the Word of light and the word of life. 2 Corinthians 4, 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Now sometimes we miss the point here and we don't hold forth the light as we should. I heard about a little boy that was in a Sunday school play and he was up on the stage and he was enjoying it, but then it came time for him to say his part and he forgot. And uh, he just completely forgot what he was supposed to say. And his mother was on the front row and she was trying to help him. And, and she was saying to him his line. She was saying, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. And finally he heard her and he stood up real tall and he said, my mother is the light of the world. <laughs> now I got to tell you, I've got a great mom. You might have, have a great mom, but your mother's not the light of the world. <laughs> um, Jesus is the light of the world. But he has put his light in us. And he says, now let it shine. Don't hinder my light, but let my light illuminate this world. The word of God illuminates. And the word of God exposes. Because verse 17 tells us, for nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest. You know, sometimes people get kind of crazy about this and they'll say things like, well, I tell you, this guy's just getting away with it. Let me just help you with something. Nobody's getting away with anything. Some of you ladies need to stop judging your husband and start practicing biblical forgiveness. And some of you husbands need to do the same for your wife. And some of you Christians towards other Christians. It, God, didn't, God didn't say it's your job to go around finding out what's wrong with everybody else. I'll tell you how he's going to do that through his word. And his word will make manifest. What you need to pray is that they'll come under the word and that they'll obey the word and that they'll hear the word of God. You see, the word of God exposes secret sin. By the way, I didn't fall off the turnip truck yesterday. That's why a lot of people that are members at Lancaster Baptist don't want to be faithful in their attendance at Lancaster Baptist because this book, not this preacher, this book exposes sin. And when there's sin in your life, you're not going to feel comfortable hearing that book preached. But the Word of God will expose sin. It, it just does that. It's, it makes it manifest. It makes it plainly known. God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, Ecclesiastes says. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 4 says that He will bring to light the hidden things of darkness. Now one of the things I learned when I was just a newlywed was the fact that, that uh, my wife, Terry, did not like bugs. I mean, she, she has a phobia of any kind of bugs. Little ones, slithery ones, big ones, flying ones. And I was pastoring a little church down near the Coachella Valley, and, 
there was a lady that gave us a single wide trailer to sleep in and I would preach the next morning and she said you guys can sleep right here right next to this little house we had for the church and we were, we were Bible college students just newly married and so we laid down there and, and uh, I turned off the lights and after a little while I felt, I felt these slight things just kind of popping on the sheet. We, it was very hot down there in the lower desert. We had no blankets, just sheets. And just boom, something fell on the sheet and then boom, another something fell on the sheet. And so I got up and I turned the light on. When I turned the light on, there were, there were probably seven or eight water roaches on the top of that sheet. The water roaches are roaches on steroids, by the way. They're like the six, the six million dollar roach. I mean, these things fly. These things uh, carry purses and, you know, guns. And they're just, they're ready to go. They're big. So, man, I swatted at them and got them off there. And then and it got my wife calmed down. And she literally, she was, she was having a panic attack. I mean, she wanted out of there. And closest hotel was 30 miles away. And we had no money anyways. And so, you know, I said, honey, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do battle tonight. I'll be the warrior for the family tonight. And then I decided, you know, if I'm going to do battle, I better keep the lights on so we, you know, know what we're battling, you know, because the light makes sin manifest. So I kept the lights on, and we literally, we, we laid under that sheet all night, and those bugs kept jumping on that sheet and jumping on that sheet. We go to the bathroom, they're on the floor, they're in the sink. I kid you not, when my wife went to brush her hair the next morning, there were water roaches in her purse and in her brush. So now when we go to a place that's near a lot of water or it's been shut up for a while or it's like a cabin where nobody's been, my wife always says, honey, you go in first, turn on the light, you do the recon, then I'll go in and come behind you. <laughs> because she wants me to turn on the light to make manifest any of those hidden situations. And that's exactly what God wor God's Word does. Some of you have some hidden corners of your heart. You've got some cockroaches in your life and the Word of God will expose that. And you need to repent of that if you're not saved and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are saved, you need to repent of that and let God have His will and His way in your life. And you see, the Word of God will expose your need. It will expose your unbelief. Verse 18 says, Take heed therefore how you hear, for whosoever hath to him shall be given, and whosoever hath not from him shall it be taken, even that which he seemeth to have. God says, open up your heart. He wants us to receive His Word. He wants us to keep His Word. And thirdly, He wants us to live his word. Verse 19, as we close this morning, the Bible says, Then came to him his mother and his brethren, and could not come at him for the press. ABC, CNN, there was a lot of press there that day. And verse 20, And it was told him by certain which said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to see thee. And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are those which hear the word of God and do it. Now, how many of you understand, all 21 of these verses have been about the word of God? And, and so Jesus is telling us here to live the Word of God. Now let's just get a, quick, a couple quick lessons as we pass through this verse 19. It says, Then came to him his mother and his what? Does it say her brethren or his brethren? His mother and what? Talk to me, what? You don't got that Reader's Digest Bible, do you? Come on now, let's, let's read that verse together. Verse 19, ready, begin. Then came to him his mother and, and could not come to him for the press. All right? So, this is Jesus and his brothers. Now, one of the false doctrines of the Roman church, and there are many, one of the false teachings of that church is what is called the perpetual virginity of Mary. And they have so lifted up Mary in a false sense, and she is highly favored among women, but she is not to be the object of prayer and adoration. She is not our co-redemptrix, as some have said. And one of the false teachings is the perpetual virginity of Mary. But the fact is that one of Mary's sons was James, who was the pastor of the church of Jerusalem and the half-brother of the Lord Jesus. We say half-brother because Jesus was conceived of the Holy Ghost. He's the Son of God. But Jesus is telling us here that Mary and his brothers were coming with her. And as they're coming along, uh, they're held up because of the large crowd. And and, and we don't know the motive for them coming. Mark says that they came because they were concerned that, that this thing was getting out of hand and that Jesus, why was he doing this? And, and, and so we see, first of all, the concern of Mary. The Bible says she was desiring to see him, to perceive him with her eyes, and they were unable to get to him. And then we see the focus of Jesus. And this is what I want you to see today. I want you to see his answer. Verse 21, the word answer uh, means that his marks are referring to the anticipation of the crowd. 
And so he answers and he says unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. Now when Jesus said that, he was not being rude to his mother. He loved his mother. Ladies and gentlemen, from the cross at Golgotha, he looked down at his mother and he said to John the beloved, John, behold thy mother. He said, take care of Mary. Jesus loved his mother. And you should love your mother too. But Jesus, when he said that, was, was simply saying when he said that my brethren and my mother are those that hear the word of God, he was literally saying, my family are those who receive my word, that is to say, my message. Now, how special is that? You know what Jesus is saying? If you, from a good, honest heart, have believed me, and you have received me as your Savior, and you believe my word, you are a part of me. You are a part of my family. And what a great privilege to be a part of the family of God. When I was a kid, we used to sing that little chorus. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Join heirs with Jesus, bought with his blood. You ought to thank God today that Jesus says about you, if you believe my word, then you're one of my brethren. You're a part of my family. And he says in Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, but he said, yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. The point of this chapter is clear. Those with whom Jesus identifies the most are those who respond to his word. And so I want you to think of this today. Three questions as we close. First, have you received his word concerning the gospel of salvation? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the incorruptible seed, by the word of God. Has there been a day in your life when you heard that Jesus died for your sin and you realized that you would fall short without Jesus and you turned to Jesus and you said, Jesus, I believe, and you called upon the Lord to save you from their sin. Your sin. Has there been a time when you were saved or born again by the incorruptible seed? I'm not asking you if you joined a church. I'm not asking you if you got baptized or confirmed. I'm not asking you if you said some words to please your mother. I'm asking you if by faith have you ever opened your heart and received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you see. Have you been saved? If you died today, where would you spend your eternity? Have you received his word? And then I ask you this question. If you have received his word, are you living out his word or are you hiding it under the bed? You know, most people that I've dealt with in counseling, the stuff they hide under the bed is not good. I've had little kids come up to me and say, Pastor, pray for my dad. He hides under his bed. Well, I just got to tell you something. The Word of God should not be under your bed. It should be lived out through your life. The only living Bible we need is your life and mine living the Bible. And the Bible says in James 1.22, Be ye doers of the Word and not what? Hearers only. Have you received His Word? Are you living the Word? And then I want to ask you this. Are you sowing the seed? Now the parable is this, the seed is the Word of God. Two weeks from today, I'm going to share an opportunity with you that will allow us as a church to touch the Antelope Valley with the gospel like this valley has never before been touched with the gospel. Two weeks from today, I'm going to ask you to help me sow the seed in the Antelope Valley as we have never sown the seed as a church family. And I want you to begin praying right now because I don't know, is there anybody in the last 12 months that you, because of sowing the seed and, and loving them and, and sharing the gospel with them, have seen them come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? Is there somebody going to heaven today because of your witness? And if not, pray with me that two weeks from today our entire church will say, I can be a part of that. I want to help sow the seed. So think about this with me. Let's stand together, shall we? Let's stand for just a moment. How many of you in this room as we stand right now can say, Pastor Chapel, I have received the Lord Jesus Christ into a good heart. I have already accepted Christ as my Savior. And I've not been perfect, and I don't bear as much fruit as some, but I believe that my faith is genuine and that God's Word is true. And based upon the promises of God, that he has sealed me unto the day of redemption. I believe right now I'm saved and I'm heaven bound. And based on 1 John 5, 13, I know that I'm heaven bound. Now, if you don't know that, again, don't fake it. Don't give me one of these thorny, thorny ground 
that's me kind of a deals. If you're not sure, it's okay to be honest. But if you're sure that you're saved and heaven bound, I wonder right now if you could just say, based upon the word of God, not because I'm something big, but because of God's grace, I'm saved and heaven bound. If you know that right now, would you lift your hand? Just lift your hand right up. All right, that's awesome. Thank you. Now, who's in this room right now who's a Pastor Chapel? I don't really know for sure that I've ever opened up my heart, pushed away the thorns, the rocks, and just said, Lord, I believe in you and you only. And you say, it looks like almost everybody raised their hand, but, but I didn't. Look it. Swallow that pride for just a minute. Forget that. Don't worry about that. If there's someone here right now who would say, I was a little religious, but I'm not sure I'm going to heaven, or I said a prayer, but I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. Pastor Chapel, I just want to be the guy that has the ears to hear and the heart to believe today. And if God's speaking to you about salvation and you're not sure that you're heaven bound, but you want to be, you want to be, you want to receive that incorruptible seed, I'd like to pray for you in just a moment. I wonder who right now would say, Pastor Chapel, I want that seed to come into my heart. I want to know that Christ is my Savior and heaven is my home. And if you want to get that settled today, I just want to pray for you. I wonder right now if you just lift up your hand and hold it there now. Just lift it there and say, I need that. Pray for me today. Thank you, sir. Who else? I need that as well. Thank you, sir, over here. Anybody up in the balcony? I need the gospel of Christ. I need to be saved. God spoke to me about it. How many of you are here right now? You say, Pastor Chapel, my wife, my kids, everyone else would know. I'll tell you, the truth of the matter is, I have Jesus. I believe His light's in me, but I've been hiding it under the bed. And I've not had the testimony at Lockheed. I've not had the testimony at the hospital. I haven't had the testimony on the job site that I should have. I've not been living the light. I've not been sowing the seed. And would you pray with me that in the right way, I'll live out the light and I'll sow the seed of the gospel this fall from my life. I want God to use me to spread the seed. You see, all of us have the seed this morning. Hold up your Bible. Would you hold up your Bible for a second? That's the seed right there. Here's the job, ladies and gentlemen. We got to get the seed out of the barn. We got to get the seed out into the field. How many of you would say, Pastor Chapel, I've got to get the seed out into the field? And God spoke to me about being better at sowing seed. Would you lift your hand this morning all over this auditorium? So let's pray about it, shall we? Father in heaven, I pray right now for those in this room who have never received Christ. I pray that today they would come and trust you as their Savior, and that they would open up their good heart, honestly, receiving Christ as their Savior. I pray today that you would help all of us in this room, that we would not be ashamed of of our testimony in Christ, that we would keep the globe clean, that we would live for you. And I pray that those who lifted their hands would be better seed sowers this week. Help us to carry gospel tracts and help us to look for opportunity to just talk to the lost this week and tell them that Jesus still saves. And I ask all of this now in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing a song of invitation. And as we sing this song, come just as you are. That's exactly how Jesus wants you to come, just as you are. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to know all the Bible. But if you know you're a sinner and you need a Savior, I want you to come and see one of the pastoral staff here at the front. There'll be ladies to talk to ladies, men to talk to men. There's somebody here to talk to you, sir, and you, sir, and others of you about knowing that you're heaven bound. If you don't know that, don't put it to chance. You can know it today. Others of you may want to come and pray that God would help you to stop hiding your faith under the bed. Others of you to be a better seed sower. If God's spoken to you about these things, you come. Others will come for baptism today. Let's sing the song, Come Just As You Are. You step out if God's spoken to your heart. If you'd like to pray with someone, if you need to make a decision for Christ today, we'll wait for you right now. God bless you, sir. Others can come right now. From the balcony, we'll wait for you. You come. Just come if the Lord spoke into your heart. We'll wait for you. Don't let the cares of this world choke out that seed. Don't let the devil pick up that seed. Piano's playing. Let's have our heads bowed for a moment. Right now, would you just ask the Lord to help you apply this passage to your life? That you would live His light. That you would spread that seed. And if you're not sure you're a Christian, there's still time to come. We'll wait for you.
Thankful for these still coming. Just take another moment in prayer. You do what God wants you to do. Thank you, Lord, for these who have come today for various reasons, especially those who came to say, I want to receive the seed into my heart. God, we pray that you'd bless their lives, and we thank you for their faith, even to step out. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us, each of us, to let your light shine this week, to spread the seed of the gospel. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name, amen.